hoping to learn quite a lot about it and your problems today. What Rado asked me to do was to sort of set this subject in the broadest possible uh, context, and, and the global context of urban groundwater, in a way, effectively, to set the context of the sort of research you're doing and, and, and the sorts of applications it could have on a broad, in a broader sense. Um, and it's a subject I've been associated with since, I, I would say, the early 1970s or mid-1970s. Uh, and really, groundwater in the urban environment has links to the environment itself, to construction, to water supply, to wastewater engineering, and to public health. It's a very, very broad and, and, and linked subject, which probably has still not had as much attention as it deserves. Um, and what I'm going to try and do here is to talk about why I think that a scientific vision of the system is important and that a more integrated policy towards urban groundwater is very often required. And I'm going to talk on a, a world stage, not uh, just a European stage, so you'll see this, this subject is, is probably much broader than you at first might think. Let's see if I can make this one work. I mean, Fairly obviously, um, urbanization, the predominant phenomena of the 20th century. And likely to continue so in the 21st century if you look at most of the predictions, particularly for Asia and also for Africa. Groundwater historically has enabled low cost utility water services in many cities of the world. Not all of them, but in many cities of the world. It's enabled in situ access for private users, and this has been very important in the developing world, something which you don't see so much in Europe, but it's extremely important issue in the developing world. And aquifer storage, if you look at it uh, rationally, offers one of the critical elements for climate change adaptation. That storage will be needed more to survive uh, climatic um, impacts on surface water sources. And we're already beginning to see this in some cities of the world. And also, there's been, a, in my lifetime, a great increase in the scale and complexity of subsurface construction in urban areas. And either high water table, falling water table, or rising water table can seriously impact the built infrastructure. And cost here, the cost side, can be very, very large. So this is, a, in a way, a small subject, urban hydrogeology, but it's got a lot of big linkages. And it's, in, it's those sort of linkages that I want to stress today. This is not primarily a research or a technical talk. It's about the context of research in that sense. It needs an integrated vision. You need to see the picture from all sides. Um, that's my, perhaps my major message. And if I look back, the first time I became aware of this was uh, in my native town of, of, of London, my native city of London, in the 1970s, when we we were well aware at that stage that the deep aquifer, the chalk aquifer, which underlies the London Basin, had been developed even then for more than 100 years and had a very depressed uh, piezometric surface. It got down to minimum levels in 1965 of that order with this scale of 15, 50 meters here, so a big depression. And we were aware that industry, uh, that London Demand for, uh, for water in central London was decreasing, abstraction was, increase, uh, was decreasing uh, quite rapidly, and that many of the other water sources were moving out to the uh, peripheral areas, and that we were expecting a water table rebound in London. Um, from a minimum position here, that was the natural position. But we haven't really focused on what that meant for our, our infrastructure in London at all until we looked at the issue of the other big issue of the 1970s, which is even a bigger one today, which is pre preventing London uh, from suffering a tidal um, surge from the, from the North Sea and flooding coming up the river and over walls uh, 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 of the river and into the city. And when we started to look at the issues of constructing a, a barrier in this area, we realized that we, it's about time we started to under, uh, understand not only the deep groundwater system, but the shallow groundwater system in the floodplain, and whether there were any relationships between them. And we started to 
put some fairly simple piezometers into the, into the alluvial deposits. And the results were extremely surprising. And we were pleased that we did it, because had we not, we'd had a lot of very nasty surprises. First of all, we discovered that the very old Victorian metro system, the shallowest of the London metros, the one that was built about 1860, 1870, 1880, was effectively a sump. It had pumping stations underneath every, every um, railway station and was pumping pretty large quantities of water out and back into the river. And effectively, it was the sump for the alluvial system of the whole of the northern, northern part of the floodplain over uh, the whole area of central London. And therefore, any change in river regime could have compromised the drainage on this old metro line, which is our inner, inner ring metro. And effectively, it changed our attitude towards the management and use of the tidal surge barrier. At first, we were building it for amenity reasons, to avoid low tide, and also to obstruct a major tidal surge. And we had to give up the idea of amenity in London, uh, in the river, because we could not afford to rise the river level by one, average river level by one or two meters because of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of, this, of this feature of the hydrology. The other thing that we realized was that there was no connection between the alluvial system and the deep chalk aquifer system than we had thought of before. We thought it was largely separated by an over-consolidated London clay. But in fact, there were windows through, and that was one of them. And this window was the sump for the whole of the south side of, of central London, flow from the river into the sun and then down into the chalk through a win windows in this area, which don't show the section in the old sections. And all of the engineering construction in this area, all of the basements and deep basements, deep car parks, were all built on the basis of, of, drained, of drained soils. And if we recovered here, we would have almost certainly flooding problems on innumerable structures in this area. And so we took the decision, despite the fact that nobody at that stage wanted any longer deep chalk groundwater in London, we took the decision that we'd have to find uses for that water and pump some and manage water levels in the chalk to keep this uh, as a, a sump for the system because of the risk to uh, structures in this area. So it's quite an, an eye-opener that uh, uh, the construction of a, a, a tidal surge barrier here could have had so many ramifications throughout the flood plain, and people were not thinking of that. And I think it was a credit to our hydrological community that we uh, spotted that these sort of things could happen as long ago as, um, as 1970, when there hadn't been much investigation at this time. But that isn't the main, my, my talk is much broader than that, but I thought I'd mention it because this is the sort of way at which I first entered into interest in urban groundwater. What I wanted to talk about uh, very quickly are at the broadest possible level now, globally, some of the main interactions and key processes between urbanization and groundwater. Groundwater's resource, use trends and issues, something about the groundwater sanitation nexus, which is so important in many countries of the world. Groundwater, very, very briefly, a, a recap on groundwater's engineering hazard, and this issue, which is very important, uh, institutional needs, if you look at cities across the world, and particularly in the developing world. Yeah. Um, let me just see if I missed. Did I miss a slide there? No, I didn't. Okay. I was going to say that um, the rest of this talk, in effect, derives from a program which I managed for 10 years for the World Bank called GWMATE, <coughs> in which we looked at something like we were a group of advisors sitting in the World Bank amidst 400 water staff dealing with loans to cities and, and agricultural areas all around the world. And we were invited by those, those um, people doing infrastructure loans and so on to look at the groundwater dimensions and to try and strengthen the groundwater dimensions in their programs. And so these comments are basically a reflection on 10 years of work with the World Bank looking in some detail at about six or seven major cities in Latin America, three in Africa, and four 
in India and Bangkok in Thailand, none in China, although we worked a lot on irrigation in China. So it's a fairly broad-based look at the developing world now and the problems of the developing world, which have linkages across to our, our, our European uh, situation in some ways, and we can learn both in both directions. So the main process is... I say groundwater in the city, an intimate but often unrecognized relationship. Um, both within the urban area itself of what's going on underneath it and the interaction between uh, surface activities and, and groundwater processes, and also in what I would call the urban groundwater in, in influence area, which can be quite large because a lot of sources now uh, are outside of the urban limits, but the overall import of water and the behavior and the interface with the rural areas is also an important topic. And this is just freshwater flows and wastewater flows, and you can see that the groundwater system has a lot of linkages here, a lot of linkages. And it is fairly rare that you can find good quantitative information, adequate quantitative information on the dynamics of those linkages. And this has been our, our, was our major effort in that team when we were trying to look at whether groundwater is important or not to, to investments in, in, in cities. Obviously, um, and I know quite a few of you are hydrogeologists here, it's going to vary an awful lot with hydrologic setting. It varies with aquifer yield and, and accessibility. If the water groundwater is very shallow, there tends to be more private use. If it's high yielding, there tends to be more utility use. And it varies a lot between the level of confinement and the oxidation status of groundwater, which affects quality. So it's not a simple picture, but it is a coherent picture looked in the broad with these variations. And it varies with utility water service arrangements, their evolution, water supply availability and affordability, and sewage system coverage. So the, the actual functioning of the hydrological <laughs> process, the, the hydrological system, varies not only with the, with the, uh, the given uh, geological setting, but also with the man-made anthropogenic, anthropogenic changes to it. And it's a complex in, but intimate relationship, but one, as I say, which is not uh, recognized enough. I guess the most important, I mean, in general terms, you can say now, and I was asked to give a broad introduction, yes, I'm speaking in general terms, urbanization impacts on groundwater, and groundwater impacts on the urban infrastructure. It's a, it's a cycle and it's a, it's a complex process. And I, I would say that I've come across a lot of cases of this without planning and a broad in, integrated vision. One person's solution to one of these problems, either a water supply, a waste disposal, or an engineering infrastructure problem, one person's solution can become another person's problem. It tends, there tends to be an awful lot of, 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 of insidious and slow linkages here. And because I know a lot of you are interested in modeling, and I'm also interested in, in, in what you're doing in modeling, you know, these sort of things, given reasonable data and reasonable understanding, are predictable. But they're not all that often predicted, if you look worldwide. They often come as surprises for urban groundwater problems. Why, and this is an institutional issue, there isn't anybody owning the problem sufficiently, one group owning that problem, such that they will commission the right people to work on it, and that you know the predictions will will arrive in time. So this is quite a, a, a common a common reality. And of course, what I'm trying to show here is that effectively, water supply, private and public, the engineering infrastructure development, its maintenance and changes to it, and waste disposal, particularly liquid waste disposal all interact with the groundwater system in different ways. They can cause aquifer abstract, uh, extraction, they can cause excessive contaminant load, or excessive infiltration to the groundwater system, which relate in, ch in changes to it. In many ways, the groundwater system is the integrating element in the, of environment in the urban area, um, particularly where cities are on, on situated on relatively permeable strata. Um, couple of General statements about recharge within the urban area now in localized recharge, not recharge to urban aquifers from outside uh, the area, but within the urban area. And the concepts in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, even into the 80s, were that 
well, the sewage impermeabilization, we're going to reduce infiltration. And, you know, therefore, it'll be, if anything, water table will fall relative to the neighboring areas. But it became evident from, well, that was the exception to the rule. There are very few cities that are that impermeable, one, that that occurs. And there are so many that we create new sources of recharge that it's usually the other way around. It's usual that there's higher rates of recharge in, in urban areas than there are outside in the neighboring areas of, with the same climate and the same hydrogeology. Why? And I think it's pretty obvious when you think about it that if you express the sorts of amounts of water that we put into our pipes and circulate around the city as if they were rainfall sorts of use of water, they're pretty high. You get rapidly get up into the thousand millimeters per annum if you've got a population density in this sort of order and a gross water a gross water production around 250 300 liters per day per capita. And of course, well, fine, but mains leak, and there's a lot of a lot of leakage to the ground. If you get 20 percent, 30 percent in many developing cities, 40 percent leakage to the ground. This represents a lot of infiltration compared to, to rainfall. And you've been able to demonstrate that in many cities, in, in effect, the effects of, of water mains, to lesser degree, sewer leakage, and in situ sanitation, where people do not have main surge, mean that the recharge rates, it, the, the man-made recharge rates in city, cities tend to outweigh the reduction that we had due to the impermeabilization. Um, and it's a good thing if you understand it and you want to use it, but it can be a, a, a difficult thing if, if, if it results in rising water table if the water's not used and so on. So it's, it's not a, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a lot here, uh, a lot more complexity and detail here that meets the eye. On quality now, if we're talking about a, a permeable sequence between uh, shallow groundwater, deep groundwater, and a unsaturated zone, um, we have, and time scales in terms of transit of this order, which would be appropriate for granular media, not for fractured media, of weeks, months, years, and decades to reach these sort of depths, perhaps more. Um, you look at it, and urban wastewater, or in-situ sanitation, sewer leakage, industrial chemicals, spillage, ground disposal, in some cases solid waste disposal, it poses a fairly substantial pressure on the subsurface environment. The impact varies very widely with the natural vulnerability of the system, which I'm trying to uh, depict here in a very simplistic way. This is where vulnerability is a bit dangerous. Um, it's a generalization about a system, and you need to be rather specific in relation to certain sorts of pollutants. Um, but very often, we get a fairly heavy uh, loading of the subsurface. And the typical sort of picture that we see is that in most aquasystems, you don't get much penetration of, 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 of the metallic iron, of the heavy metals, for example, but you do get a fairly big uh, uh, penetration of, of initially ammonia and, and nitrates, elevate, more elevated sodium chloride, a lot of dissolved organic carbon, and these things can reach the deeper levels, the things that are more persistent in here, plus those types of organic chemicals in the pollutant load which do not degrade or have high density and immiscibility, they tend to go fairly rapidly through the, the sequence and reach depth. So we've got substantial quality deterioration in urban groundwater from a variety of processes, but um, a good deal of variation in the detail depending on this concept of vulnerability, you could talk about more, and uh, in effect, quite often, these uh, ground, even shallow groundwaters under cities can be used uh, with caution and are, are very often used because people don't have access to any, anything else. A few, so those were sort of very, very general things about the processes. What about groundwater resource? And this is a big issue. It may not be a big issue in Bucharest. It may not be a big issue necessarily in um, a large number of, of, uh, of cities. But in the developing world, it's extremely important. Um, I've tried to get facts on this, and it seems extraordinary in you know, 21st 
century that we don't still do not really know globally how where water supplies of urban areas come from. We don't have a good inventory. We know much more about irrigated agriculture. We can do it from satellites. But we don't know that, that, that much about urban groundwater. The institution the International Water Association doesn't know. The UN Habitat doesn't know. And you have to grope around to try and get statistics in this area. But for Europe, it's fine. Euro, the group of European uh, water companies, has excellent data. And here we've got to be a bit careful. We're not talking about, we're talking about urban water use, urban water supply, but some of that will be water coming from outside the city, from well fields outside the cities, a lot of it will be. But the total figure is that 61% by volume of European um, water supply, and here we cannot completely distinguish urban and rural, because in Northern Europe, the, the systems tend to be combined in England, Netherlands, Denmark, Northern France, and Northern Germany. But, 61% uh, by volume of a, a supply to 508 million people. So it's 300 million people of which, uh, in Europe, quite a lot of those are urban dwellers drinking groundwater, either coming from underneath cities or imported to, to cities. We go to the developing world, and you can't, there's no similar database anywhere. You have to go to professional contacts. And it's a slow process. I've been trying to do this because I think it's important that we know I have good data for some countries, more than I put here, but Pakistan, for example, 18, 18 million, 53% of the population in cities of over a million. In Peru, 3 to 5 million, very seasonally, and these are for, this is for cities over 100,000. In Zambia, 2 to 3 million, uh, 36 to 54, 4% 4 seasonally of 76 municipalities. But it's extraordinarily difficult to get this data. Nobody seems to have, 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 have archived it. You have to go utility by utility, and very often you have to go to individual uh, it's, uh, scientists or engineers working in those places to find out the information. On the other hand, and this is uh, uh, something you, you need to be feel interested in the subject and the broad need to bear in mind, the other route of understanding of private use is to look at um, demographic and health survey data, which is done regularly by the international agencies, with WHO, UNICEF, and all of these, it's done with sample surveys of urban areas. And this gives you the urban populations served by unpiped groundwater sources. This is the private, the private or non-reticulated use. And here are some remarkable figures. Nigeria, 43 million urban dwellers, 43 million urban dwellers just in Nigeria using unpiped groundwater from with urban areas. It's a big issue and a big concern for the future, how this is, is managed, how sustainable it is, how risky it is, and so on. Um, Bangladesh, 29 million, and it's not a very urbanized country. Um, Pakistan, in this case, 16 million is a lot of private use. Other, um, other countries, not as much. Um, I have a more extensive list of this. What I'm trying to say here is we don't really know nearly enough about this uh, on a global sense. Now, if you look at some of the problems that are arising in this area um, from municipal and private groundwater use and, and some common trends, for urban water utility needs, sustainability tends to be a problem because there are rarely sufficient resources within municipal limits to support the requirements, and there's also the quality threats that we talked about. So, on the whole, where the utilities are taking water just from within urban limits, it tends to be falling water tables. So some quality problems are sustainability problems. But if you look historically, the fact that they've been able to develop that has often resulted in lower water tariffs and better water service levels. So if you go to India, you see that the cities on the indo ganges plain, because they have wells, uh, the, the municipal water supply wells, have a much better service level. It won't be good by your standards, by European standards. Once, one every six hours, they get in, in cities on the average on the on the Indo-Gangetic Plain. Whereas down in Peninsular India, where uh, groundwater is not so large-scale groundwater is, uh, is, is not hydrogeological, hydrogeological possible, they're getting one hour's water supply in 24 or 48 hours in the average Indian city. And so everybody has private small wells to survive. Um, um, but, so this private use business in those sort of situations is a major phenomenon. Particularly if water well construction cost is cheap. And in India now it's down to 500 US dollars, a shallow well and a pump. They've got it down to that scale. So everybody who's got any money has them when the water supply is one hour and 24, one hour and 48. 
And so this whole phenomena of extracting water from within urban areas is becoming a major issue uh, globally. It represents a coping, uh, a coping with a, a water supply problem initially, and lastly, as I'll show, a cost reduction strategy, because it's cheaper. Just to give you a flavor of this, and I think you know, I'm trying to broaden this debate beyond your, your, your research in the global context. This is the city, major city of Lucknow in, in central India on the Indo-Gangetic Plain, sitting on the best aquifer in the world, wonderful aquifer. It has, it used to take its water supply from a small river here, but rapidly the city grew. It, it, this was inadequate. And it did two things. It drilled 500 deep tube wells into this aquifer for 215 million liters a day. But it managed to negotiate some water from an irrigation canal coming in from the foothills of the Himalayas here, but with a lot of competition with agriculture, for another 250. And it's got six hours a day supply and another 1,100 private wells. But for planning reasons within municipal law and practice in India, it cannot go outside its municipal boundaries to drill wells. So it all tends to get very concentrated with falling water table and quality problems and is very poorly planned. And you can't, this is not a, a sustainable route to the future for cities growing, um, and there are many of these on the integrated plain, growing very fast with populations of two and three million. The evolution in this case normally tends to look like this if you try to generalize. You know, 50 years here, advancing time, and the population and total water use. If, there's, if you've got a, a reasonable aquifer in an area, the city tends to take from it in its early years. And there'll be some private use um, as well. But with time, this usually, when populations get up, about half a million to a million, depending on the quality of the and size and scale of the aquifer, this is generally not enough for what you can obtain locally. And you go down two courses of importing surface water sources and or developing major external well fields and importing groundwater. In the best of cases, you have all the sources. You retain within urban areas where appropriate, you have well fields, and you have imported surface water. So it gives you more security, it gives you more robustness of, of source to meet drought and meet other problems. But within this picture with lack of investment, you get major periods when the private use escalates. And sometimes this can become dominant in some cities of Africa and India. The top bit, the private use, is in fact taking up more than half of the graph. This is what tends to happen. Um, I want to give you now an example of the private use. And this is not from a, a poor city, it's from a rapidly uh, growing and, and rich city, but it, it gives you an idea. This is Fortaleza in northern Brazil, population about 3 million, 3.5 million, growing very, very fast. It has now a good and reliable water supply from surface water, but it was at a high cost. It involved a major transfer canal uh, and a major treatment works. And before that, it had very, very frequent droughts. And it sits on a rather thin, small, sand, windblown sand aquifer, um, vulnerable to saline intrusion. But there is groundwater around throughout the, the city area. 55% of the population have water wells, which date back to the days before the surface water supply was improved, when Brazil was more like India is today. And there are at least, going up to was 10,000 wells capable of producing the equivalent of 40% of what is today the utility water supply. Most multi-residential dwellings have high yielding tube wells, so all of these properties here have tube wells as well as means water. And the fascinating thing is with Latin, with Brazilian ingenuity, what have they done? We, it took us a long time to understand what was going on here, but the water company, having invested in this major uh, surface water transfer and treatment work, seemed to have problems in selling its water. Nobody, nobody was using it. The demands were below expected. And the flows to the sewers were much bigger than expected, and the treatment costs were going up. And we did some detailed investigations in this area and discovered that, in fact, that all of these properties, in fact, took the mains water up to what was called the social tariff. 
the amount of water allowed for the, the minimum use, I think it was 10 cubic meters per family per month, which was on sale at that sort of price. But when they went on to the next tariff, they stopped using the mains water and all switched on their wells. And so the existence of, the, of this private, unregulated, unorganized realm resource was effectively compromising the finance of the municipal water company and the whole investment plan, and also the cross subsidy from richer luxury use to poor use. And the um, way out here was that the, we, the water company had to get involved with the water resources agency in knowing all the properties that had pumps and charging them a nominal sewage use charge if they had a borehole. Similar things going on in all the coastal cities of Brazil with CFA and so on. Otherwise, the sewage side, they could not stop the private water use. That was legitimate in Brazilian law. They paid for the wells. They were using them within Brazilian law. But they had to collect a sewage charge. Fascinating story of just how uh, open access to groundwater interacts with all, at all sorts of levels in the investment cycle in cities. This private, as I say, therefore, this private, wealth, uh, private use can distort water utility operations and have major implications for finance and investment. Some ways, if you're looking at water resource sense, it could be regarded as recovering leakage from water utility water supply and good practice for secondary users because um, you don't need uh, potable quality for you know, watering gardens, cleaning cars, and filling, even possibly filling swimming pools. Um, so there's a big debate going on in Brazil at the moment, and in, to this degree in India and, and other places where, they, and there will be in places like Nigeria and many African cities, of what management measures should we take for this urban groundwater where it's in, largely in private use? Should we try and enhance recharge through rainwater, uh, rainwater harvesting and, and, and so on? Try and reduce the pollution load, in other words, to do the sorts of things we would normally do in Europe, improve the construction status of private wells, reduce the in-situ sanitation loads by sewering in areas where there's a lot of groundwater use, advise users on the potential hazards, or even charge and regulate this private use, which is not as easy as it may at first sound. So it's a sort of very rapid for me in, in relatively ability to try and paint you the picture of what's happening around the world in use trends and issues which are very important, provide a very important context for our work in urban hydrogeology, because these are the sorts of problems that we have to, to talk to, to interact with. The, in many countries of the world, this is an equally important issue, managing what I would call the groundwater sanitation nexus, because um, while in Europe we have quite a high level of, 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 of uh, main sewage coverage for wastewater, that is not the norm in the developing world. And normally, uh, sewage is you know, a smaller part of cities, usually 10, 20%, 25%. But the vast majority of the city is using in-situ sanitation, which traditionally was the, with the, you know, involves heavy discharges to the ground. Um, there are two separate and very different facets to this problem as you go around the world. One is so the in-situ sanitation load, which I mentioned, which always causes excessive nitrogen load, sometimes pollution with um, uh, fecal bacteria if the aquifer is vulnerable, always in in includes a, a shadow of organic carbon, as is organic carbon. And these days, because of community chemicals, even in developing countries, the increasing presence of pharmaceuticals, disinfectants, and so on in, in, in urban groundwater, which people then are, are, are reusing in private supply. So it's a, it's a, co a complex area of, of risk assessment. The other big one in the arid cities um, uh, is the issue of where there is some sewage, the, the bit, the 20%, the 25%, maybe the 15% that does go out of sewage effluent, is nearly always used downstream for irrigation. And usually causes, I mean, the, the wastewater irrigation downstream of cities usually is more an artificial recharge scheme in dis disguise because the sort of application rates to the land that people use in these areas are so high that, that a bigger part of the total wastewater infiltrates the groundwater and goes into the plant. So we're talking about trying to manage that issue and it's all about spatial management um, uh, and uh, uh, risk assessment in, in, in general terms. 
I don't have to detail too much you here the, the whole business of the, the, the interaction. Um, we are beginning to look quite seriously now into mitigating the answer the answer of sanitation uh, uh, groundwater problem, which is sort of a problem in villages, rural villages as well as in urban areas, and developing well by better maintenance of the situ sanitation units, improved technology like dry eco sanitation with urine separation, because the urine that produces most of the fluid load. Um, but these things are very difficult to retrofit, so they're only going to apply to new areas. Uh, decentralized wastewater treatment is coming in, and, and so more efficient reuse, and so on. And also, I, I guess at the end of the day, many of this question of what, you, what criteria you use for prioritizing the extension of, and investment in main sewage cover. And do you do this in high population areas, primarily in high population areas where there is a dependency on, on local groundwater for water supply? These are the sorts of things that are issues that are very common in, in, in World Bank programs around the world. And downstream, I mean, this is a very common scene where you get almost the surface drains, and this is sewage effluent going straight into surface drains out, and in this case, being irrigated on fields next to a municipal water supply well. The, you know, just a lack of spatial planning, a lack of awareness, um, and, and this obviously this would be better treated, it would be better reused in areas, and these wells should be protected. You see far too much of this immediately downstream of major urban areas in the arid in, in, in developing cities in the in arid countries. Groundless engineering has it, which you uh, probably is at the top of your agenda. Well, I won't, don't want to say too much on this, so I want to listen to you and join in the debate. But I think it's fairly fairly evident that groundwater and the city is an evolving relationship. Uh, on per where, ground, where, where cities have been built on permeable strata. And it very often in initial stages uses gravel within the city with lowering of the water table and land subsidence, a, a, a positive drainage effect but potential land subsidence if, this, if, the, if there are material in the system which is, is uh, not already overacted, let's just say, is subject to, to, to settlement. But sooner or later, the water supply capture tends to go outside the cities and be imported in, which causes uh, a rebound, which I've talked about, and therefore we have a different type of problem, probably a more costly problem in the longer run. Um, and it tends to get worse with time. And so, you know, I've just taken a couple of pictures of the end extreme. This is a fairly small city uh, in Mexico with those sort of conditions on but on lacustrine sediments with, with quite a lot of faulting and major differential substance, a lot of urban infrastructure damage from urban groundwater extraction. Sewers underneath here is the worst. The sewers stop flowing in the direction they were, they were, they were meant to because of these lines of differential substance. Whereas if you come across to even still cities in the developing world, but those have got down through this cycle, Buenos Aires in Argentina, you have a rapidly rising water table and all sorts of drainage problems uh, in, the, in the urban area. This would also apply to Riyadh, it would apply to quite a lot of uh, cities around the world. And the case of Buenos Aires is a particularly interesting one in, in this context, and I'll just mention it a little bit more. As Rodri said, I had just a touch more time than originally planned. Um, Buenos Aires used to take a significant part of that. 30, 40% of its uh, water from groundwater from this aquifer, and all the industrial water came from this aquifer. And the, but the natural water table is fairly shallow. Here's the Rio de la Plata. And the long-term water table position due to extraction looks something like that. Now, there became fears about quality in this aquifer. Fairly delayed because it's quite, it was, quite a lot of separation from the surface, but fears about increasing nitrates, fears about some industrial solvents getting into groundwater supplies. And they made the decision, uh, without talking to anybody, to construct a new treatment plant upstream on the Rio del Plata. It's a uh, line here. You have to go quite a long way upstream before you get uh, fresh water for suitable for urban, urban treatment, and import to the city. 
and they made a decision to close all the municipal water supply wells immediately in one go. In fact, it was an instruction to the French concessionaire that was operating the system from the municipal government. At the same time, Argentina was in a down cycle in relation to its industry and its exchange rate with the dollar, and most of the industrial wells collapsed. And there was a remarkably fast water table rebound to water levels higher than the original water table because of the amount of leakage and, and, and recharge to the aquifer. Difficult to paint on the scale. It led to the fact that in a substantial part of the city, the sewers ceased to operate. They started to overflow rather than flow completely un unhandleable. And the, none of the septic tanks were working. They were overflowing in gardens. And so there was an extremely insanitary situation in an area with a population of about 2 million. And this is in a relatively advanced uh, country like Buenos Aires. And then, that's not that the hydrogeologists in, 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 in Argentina and in Buenos Aires didn't realize that this might occur. It's so they were never consulted in the decision making because there was not the level of, should we say, consortium approach to the problems. It was a one off decision about a health scare and new investments associated with the renegotiation of a water, uh, water, uh, water operational right. And it demonstrated uh, just how interlinked these, these, these problems are. Now, receiving solution with mixture of drainage and reactivation of some of the wells and so on, a complex and, and costly solution. And that takes me, in a way, through the sequence to the last subject, which, having worked in this area for quite a few years, from, should we say, the early 70s to now, it's, it's almost 40 years, I guess. Um, that I feel quite strongly about, and I think that the bank feels, World Bank feels strongly about, and certainly the Global Water Partnership does, that we really need stronger institutional arrangements for effective management of groundwater uh, in urban areas. And if we're going to make full use of the enormous amount of advances in the science, and I, I know you've been advancing the science of, uh, of this yourselves, we're going to make full use of that, we do need a more effective and integrated institutional platform to really make use of, of, our, of our understanding. And so this is not a, a, a little bit of social science added on. This is perhaps the core of core issue when it comes to, to management. But when you look at it worldwide, groundwater in the city is too often an unspoken relationship. You don't talk, they don't talk about it much in executive meetings. You won't hear in London groundwater mentioned all that often. You didn't before the 1970s. Despite the fact that we use a lot of water from and much water use in developing cities, certainly, is that the effluent that's close to the ground is either unregulated or illegal. So people would even talk about it less because it's, it's illegal, it's politically embarrassing, and so on. You don't talk about it. So it's not much discussed by the infrastructure sector. But regularization of this situation becomes an urgent policy need if you believe the sort of uh, picture that I'm talking about here and the importance of the subject. You know, to, this is by way of conclusion, groundwater forms the invisible link between various facets of the urban infrastructure. Ground, urban groundwater tends to affect everybody, a lot of people, but often it's a responsibility of no single body, no single organization. It needs to be managed, even if no major utility water supply interest exists. In some cases, it will be the water supply uh, uh, utility, which is the main interest, but in others, uh, it's not, and, and a laissez-faire approach is often costly and in, in, in developing city context pretty, can be pretty hazardous. But how do we get this sort of broader, well, you know, this is a horrible American word, stakeholders. We say interest parties in England, but stakeholder is one. Um, broader stakeholder involvement is essential. Well, the best examples I've seen, the best that I've been able to help with and promote are where there's some sort of standing review panel or stakeholder consortia that look at this subject and that those people link with the academic centers and link with the expertise and get regular advice from those centers about, about the resource and how it behaves. I think this is, the, this is the key to keeping this on the agenda and keeping it under review. Um, but there's a question even there about who should take the management lead in these consortia or standing review panels. Should it be the municipal authority? And sometimes it's a bit difficult for them. It seems underground water. It's, they've got hundreds of other things to worry about. The water resource regulatory agency, well, probably yes, but very often they're quite weak and quite small and trying to deal with large land areas and they don't focus closely enough on the urban dynamic. 
They, they can't. They haven't got the staff and the time. Should it be the Public Health Ministry, perhaps in some cases, the Water Service Utility itself, or the Chamber of Commerce? What sort of mixture of these do we need to, to, to bring this, to keep this um, issue under review? Um, and I think this is, is, you know, there's not one single answer to that question. It depends where you are and what the problem is, but I'm pretty certain that things are better and these, what I call here the institutional vacuum, is better when filled by this sort of arrangement. And I just wanted to show you a couple of things of what I call success stories, because I think it's important to end on some success stories in terms of urban management. Um, and I'll be very brief about them, but I think that it's important to say and depend on this note, where I think the institutional and the technical and the management got together and achieved something um, uh, positive for the future and sustainable for the future. Obviously, as I said before, and this is a major problem, a uh, major thing around the world, very often conjunctive use, you know, with river intake or intake from dams, well fields, and some use within the city and appropriately spatially controlled wastewater treatment and reuse is the answer. Very often in the developing world we start with this and how do we get from one to the other and these examples have something of that in them. And the first one is from Lima. We're not, we're not taking examples from Europe. The first one is from Lima and Peru, which, uh, forgive the rather small diagram, but let me just go through it for you. It's what I call an example of successful aquifer stabilization through integrated management. It, for a long time, the Lima had, it's a very dry area, the rainfall, 30 millimeters a year, streams coming out of the Andes, is what, which infiltrate the aquifer, a major source of water supply. Big city, eight, nine million these days, but um, grown from four or five million you know, in, in recent decades, with the water table was falling very seriously, like that. That's 85 meters, and this level here is 25 meters. So it's fallen 60 meters in a coarse, very permeable aquifer over around, this is 1960 here to <coughs> 1980, 1990, in 30 years. Very serious situation in the sense that the aquifer was not that deep, and it was being exhausted, and it effectively was the strategic reserve for water in the area, although there are rivers emerging from the Andes, which have very variable flow. So what was done? Well, it was a 220 million US dollar investment and a lot more sweat in terms of institutional organization to do basically three things. One was to connect up the city better so that more of the city could be provided either from groundwater wells or from the river treatment works. The main river comes in somewhere here. Or treatment works here. Yeah. That was the first thing to do. So the conjunctive, conjunctive use was a reality. The second thing was to improve the recharge of the aquifer from, from riverbed works as it came in from the Andes, and also regulate a bit the flow in the river um, with some uh, major capital works in the in the and uh, neighbouring Andes chain. But you know this was only part of the issue. Uh, this river is very subject to mining pollution in some parts of the year and very heavy sediment load um, in, the, in the wet season. So it's a very, this, this river is not that a reliable source of, of water supply. You very much need this aquifer to survive bad times in terms of river quality and yield. And then the other thing they did was to regulate all of the wells, reduce the public water supply abstraction, so it came down from peak levels here to about the uh, new levels here, with a scheme that started in 1991. And be more, much more selective, particularly where there was a saline intrusion problem from the Pacific Ocean down here, reducing industrial abstraction and negotiating changes uh, in this area. But the end product is they have stabilized the water table. It's rising gently. It's rising too much in one or two areas. There are drainage problems in the lower areas. And they're beginning to look at a, a, a planned stable level for this aquifer in keeping with the, its use as a strategic reserve when surface water is, is compromised by quality or not available uh, due to drought impacts. So a major change and a, a, a success story in the making. This was from about 1991 and we're now here 2008. 
last data I've got, and these are the counts and recovery uh, of the water table um, uh, in this diagram. So a major success story. How is it managed? It's the interesting thing. Well, government and the Water Source Agency had so little capacity for such a big country that it decided to give the job to the municipal water utility. So it transferred the job to the water utility and asked it to build a department for aquifer management within what we in English call England call Chinese walls, such that it was operating as, uh, as a um, contractor to national government using its logistic capability to get around the city, but to do a task um, that was separate from the, the straightforward issue of water supply. And that arrangement, which is very unusual, but not very ideal, worked. It worked well, the results are there. The other excellent example comes from Asia, Bangkok in Thailand, which had a real problem, a really very serious problem of groundwater over extraction. This is 1980 to 1995. Water tables had fallen down to minus 60, minus 70 in the main productive aquifers, with land subsidence reaching, average land subsidence reaching a meter, and in some areas being worse very subject to flooding from tidal surges in the sea, sea surges, sea level city, major concern um, about land subsidence. Um, and initially, they thought they were going to control the problem just by changing municipal water supply. Back in these sorts of dates, the water supply was largely from wells in the outer areas, and in the end, they closed all of these wells and built a river treatment plant and imported all of them, but imported part of the water from outside to reduce the abstraction. But it didn't work because the cost of that abstraction, uh, that new water supply, was so high that there was a boom in private groundwater drilling for all the states, condominiums, factories. And in fact, the rates of subsidence and the rates of uh, groundwater decline increased in those years, in the 1980s, even after they greatly reduced the, the public abstraction. So they had to find a way of regulating the public abstraction, and they went, uh, the private abstraction, and they went through a process of a painstaking and process of um, uh, registering all the wells, starting to charge for, for use for even quite small volumes, a ban on new world water well construction that was followed carefully, a period of closure for some existing wells in critical areas that say people were given five years or ten years to look for alternative water supplies with help from the municipality. And I say, metering of progressive charging for groundwater use. And they actually increased this, they introduced this in a, a very low cost rates. This is uh, three US cents per cubic meter here in for ground, private groundwater use in 1983. And they put it up to all, by 2005 to, well, 2000 to 20 cents and 2005 to 42 cents for a cubic meter, and were quite scrupulous about this process of, of inspection and charging. And they succeeded in stabilizing and in fact recovering the aquifer through this route, and greatly reducing the rate of substance in, 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 in recent years. They have a target of what they aim, they obviously want to eliminate further, further substance, and to have a target level for these like, deeper aquifers that they're aiming towards. Um, and they're using price as the regulator. And that's pretty sophisticated stuff. It really is, in these usual terms. Who did this? This was a newly empowered water resource agency. The Thai Groundwater Resources Department, which is part of the Ministry of the Environment, with new powers and a clear mandate to act in the critical areas of the country. But it is a success story because they need the aquifer for the same sort of reasons. It's a very valuable source of water. Um, in emergency, these rivers are not that secure, but you can't use it at the levels they were using before without paying the price of land, of serious land substance. Thank you. That's a battle of what to say. It was a very broad talk, but it was trying to, as Andrew uh, asked me, to try and show just how big this subject is and how important bad science is in the urban areas. If you're interested in reading more about the broader world scene, well, there is quite a lot published from our program. Um, it was called GW Mate. It lasted for 10 years in the World Bank, and it, everything that we published is it, on that website. It's also on the Global Water Partnerships website. And it's been, you know, there's a series of case histories, briefing notes, and major synopses of, of, of 10 year experience on the subject around the world. But uh, 
I hope you found this rather broad introduction of some interest to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.